All right, so good evening, everybody. Uh, if you don't know already, my name is Laura Ney. I am the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent for athens Clark County, um, and that is with the University of Georgia and the county itself. Um, we do the series, the Green Thumb Lecture Series, been doing it for years. We start in February and end in November. So this is our kickoff for 2020, 2022, 2022, not 2020, 2022. So welcome to our, our kickoff class. Uh, we have a variety of speakers that come and join us and give excellent presentations. The majority of them are actually our Master Gardener Extension volunteers. This is like a speaking program that was developed through that program. Um, and, but occasionally I get the privilege to jump in and do a topic that I enjoy talking about. So today I'm gonna be your presenter and we're gonna talk about starting a garden from scratch. Uh, it's a wide topic. We're gonna go into as many different things as we can. I tried to really pull out the questions and the most salient uh, issues and considerations that come up when as people usually call in or, or email us at the office and have questions. So I tried to address as many of those as possible in this presentation. Um, and like I said, if we're talking about something and you have a follow up question um, about that specific thing, please feel free to drop it in the chat. If I'm able to, we'll We'll talk about it right then, and if not, uh, we can certainly cover it at the end. So the key topics that we're going to try to hit today are going to be first choosing a site. So where to put your garden, first things. Um, deciding if you want a garden in ground or in a raised bed of some sort. Considerations for what you want to do and prepare for before you actually get started planting choosing what you may want to plant and whether or not you should be using, you know, pre-starting transplants somewhere or even buying them or direct seeding into the ground or into your beds. So the site, first of all, if you're going to choose a garden site, I don't know if, you know, you you have a location, you've moved into a new home or if you've been somewhere for a while and you just want to start a garden for the first time, you're four top considerations and what I would say almost completely necessary for a good garden site that's going to be successful is one. And this one's really difficult because we don't have a lot of control over this. And I know I grew up in Atlanta and I've been in Athens for years. We live in the Piedmont and these beautiful wooded neighborhoods. Um, and so we don't always have a great full sunny spot. And that can be a really big challenge for people I know right off the bat. But I will say, if you are looking to grow vegetables, herbs, or fruits of most kinds, and we'll get into that a little bit later, sun is gonna be your number one priority. So if there's some little square section of your yard somewhere in your yard that really gets more sun than the rest of it, try to identify where that is and that's gonna be your best shot for vegetables. Everything else aside, if you don't have a sunny location, uh, you're gonna have a really hard time. The, well, I, I'm going too far into it. It's gonna be, <laughs> we have slides on all of these. So sun is one, water is one. Uh, you're gonna need a connection somehow, access to water for your garden. Plants are gonna need water protection, which we'll talk about what that means, and then convenience, which is something that some people often don't think about. So I talked about this a little bit. If you're planning on doing a vegetable garden or producing most edible things, they, most plants are gonna want full sun, which is at least six hours. And to be honest, a lot of vegetables, especially those like tomatoes and things that produce like what we consider a fruit on the, on the vegetable and even some root vegetables as well. Anything that's producing something packed with sugar um, is gonna need a lot of sun. So even more closer to eight to 10 would be ideal. Um, that's how the sugar is made is through sunlight and they really need a lot of it to make a high quality plant and, and produce. Um, less sun than that, if you don't have a spot with as much sun as your plants would like, this could lead to poor production. It could lead to poor quality of the fruit or produce that you are able to produce. And it can also even lead to disease issues just because the plants are not able to dry out as much. It, it creates a slow growing plant that's not as vigorous and more susceptible to disease. 
and it can lead to the shade and the moisture, especially in our moist, humid summers can lead to um, increased susceptibility to pathogens like funguses. So sunny, do your best. See if you can find a sunny spot. So what if you don't have full sun? Because like I said, I hate saying, you know, kicking off the whole thing with, well, you need sun. And then if you just, I was in a house before that I just really didn't. I had maybe a couple pots that sort of made it. Um, there's like one spot on my back porch where I was able to grow a few tomatoes. But for the most part, I really couldn't vegetable garden. Um, however, if you're in that situation, there are a handful of things that will tolerate a lot less sun than like your tomato um, or pepper. And these, in, these are, there are some herbs that fall into this category. Some of them listed, and this is not comprehensive, I admit, um, but just sort of to get you started thinking of some things you could do. Uh, chives, parsley, mint, thyme, tarragon, rosemary, oregano, and lemon balm can all do okay with less than full blazing sun. Uh, your leafy greens are gonna often be okay or a, a lot better off if you're not getting eight hours of sun and, and sometimes even six, less than six hours of sun. They may not be as prolific. Uh, you might have like punier leaves on there, but if you really just wanna be able to garden and you simply don't have the sun, concentrating on stuff that is producing a leaf rather than a sugary fruit or a root um, is the way to go. And then in terms of even fruits, there are some that have adapted to not need quite full sun. And so the um, ones that are most common are gonna be brambles, which just means like your berries, like your raspberries and blackberries um, and dewberries, if you see those around, and also sometimes blueberries. And the reason for that is that all of these plants sort of adapted to grow along wooded edges and uh, stream sides and things. So they've just, they are producing a sugary fruit, but they grew wildly and were adapted growing sort of on that uh, edge uh, of the forest. And so they do a little bit better when they don't get full, full sun. Having said that, they probably would produce more if they had full sun, but this is, um, you know, some options for you. Water. So uh, I am guilty of probably everything that I'm gonna tell you guys, you probably you shouldn't do. I've been gardening or trying to garden for years and years and years, and I've been in unideal places plenty of times and I've tried to make it work. And I'll tell you, it's really hard to do if you don't take all these things to, into consideration. If you don't have water access at your point where you're gardening, it's gonna make things a lot harder. Um, it's really difficult to get your plants established and to keep things wet when they really need to be wet. If you're having to trek somewhere, occasionally just barely keep things alive by last ditch efforts to get water to your plants every once in a while. So make sure wherever you're gonna plan your garden that you are able to access water somehow. You can either run a hose from a spigot around another side of a house, might just mean having a very long hose. Um, but if you have, you know, you have a water hookup somewhere and you have multiple choices, I would go with the place that's gonna have convenient water access. And we'll talk about irrigation more in depth at, towards the end of the talk, um, but one of the best things you can do, in my opinion, especially for vegetable gardens, is to hook up a simple drip irrigation system, or even if it has to need to be a sprinkler system to your garden, and just put a basic timer on your on the beginning of your hose or your hookup. And that way, you figure out what your garden needs and when it needs it, and you can just kind of set it, and then you're not forgetting and letting things dry out or or overwatering. Um, so that's a, that's a good way to go is just go into the hardware store. And this is just one of many, many, many types of timers that are out there now, but you can get a pretty simple one. It'll do the trick. Another consideration is some sort of protection for your garden. It's gonna depend a little bit on what your situation is. Having said that, I glanced in the chat box and I know in Athens, um, deer are omnipresent. So, uh, I would say deer protection from deer is a consideration pretty much anywhere you are in Athens. 
and probably uh, throughout a lot of the state. Um, there are a lot of fencing options for deer. We could do a, there's actually a great presentation that one of our master gardeners does on raised beds and deer fencing. And he goes into all of the materials and all of the options and the pros and cons. And I'm happy to answer some of those. If y'all have some specific questions about deer fencing, some of the things that I'll throw out there is yes, they can jump very, very high. So an ideal deer fence would be somewhere around eight, eight feet or higher. That's very difficult to do and it can be expensive with wood, but you have options with different types of netting. There are also ways of doing offset deer fences where it's a lower, much simpler wire situation. It's a lot cheaper and not as enormous. Uh, deer don't have great depth perception. So there are plenty of um, models of how to set up offset deer fences that are a lot shorter that can also be effective. But even if you don't have an eight foot high fence, deer are just like everybody else. And if there's an area that's fenced off in your yard and there's plenty to nibble on in your neighbor's yard and around the neighborhood, there's a lower chance that they're going to put as much pressure on your garden. So if you have an area of your backyard or something that's already fenced off, that also has sun and water, that's maybe a consideration you wanna make, or you might wanna think through when you're budgeting and planning for your garden, how you might wanna put up some sort of barrier around your garden area. I put chicken and dogs on here too, because I don't know if y'all have chickens or dogs, but both can cause problems in your garden. Um, if you have a way to keep your dogs out of your garden, you may have much more relaxed, well-behaved dogs than I do, but mine will roll in the plants. Um, if I'm digging, dogs and chickens really like when they see you digging and um, turning over fresh dirt, it really kind of triggers something in them and they love to go and dig in the same place. So one issue with going in and preparing a nice new seed bed and planting everything and having everything really nice and ready, um, is that animals tend to, if you have domesticated animals, they really enjoy coming in behind you and taking advantage of that fresh turned over dirt as well. So just a consideration, I've lost plenty of seed beds to my chickens wandering into the garden after me and scratching it all up and turning, like throwing the seed everywhere. So protection is just, a, just something to think about. Uh, it's, it's good that we, we finished off the break at home uh, the right way. And, uh, we all right, um, and if everybody could try to keep themselves muted, I can go in and mute folks um, as needed, but I'm having to flip back and forth between screens. So convenience is the last thing when considering site. That's just something that we don't think about as much, um, but all I'm gonna say about what that is, just honestly in human nature, the closer and more convenient your gardening space is, the better taken care of it's going to be. I have not, read studies on this, but I've seen it and it's it's very true in my own life and I've talked to others and they agree wholeheartedly. Gardens, even a small one, really do take a lot of little bits of attention at least. So it could be noticing that something's going on with the irrigation that's not right and something you wanna catch before too late, just going in there. And if you walk by your garden, relatively frequently, it's easier to just keep up with it, weed a little bit here and there so things don't get out of hand. The further out of sight, out of mind is very true, I think, with gardens. And then also, you just don't want to have something that's going to be a difficult trek, either before or after work or whenever you have free time to get down there and bring supplies and materials, um, or even just to go down and do basic maintenance and visiting your garden. So, Having it nearby your house, where you're going to be anyway, where you can keep an eye on it, um, can go a surprisingly long way. So we talked about siting. The next thing I'd love to touch on is whether or not to do an in-ground garden or a raised bed. Um, and I don't know, maybe some of y'all have done one or the other, maybe you've done both, and I'd, I'd actually love to hear your take on it if you've uh, experimented with both in ground and uh, raised bed gardens. But there are definitely pros and cons for each and there's some are better suited for certain people's situations 
versus others, or you can do a mix. Uh, you can have some raised bed gardens and you can have some in-ground, just depending on what you wanna grow in each and um, how you wanna manage that. So some reasons why you might wanna do a raised bed garden. One, especially in our area, we're in the Piedmont here in Athens, Georgia. And while I don't hate our clay soil all that much, um, it has its difficulties. And one of the biggest difficulties is drainage and compaction. And especially some of these, I would say the newer homes, maybe even worse because they've recently been graded and compacted. Um, you can have a really hard time with water drainage, which can cause um, water logging, root rot, poor plant growth, and all sorts of frustrating issues where you can't figure out why your plants just aren't thriving and doing well. Raised bed gardens are a great option if you just have a really compacted clay or rocky area that's going to be hard to take a long time to amend or break up um, and improve the texture of. You can just create your own raised bed on top of it. Um, the other uh, benefit of raised bed gardens is you have sort of like a concentrated area, not only to focus your attention and like we talked about just going in and weeding and taking care of this um, nice closed off area. It's a smaller sort of concentrated area to put uh, fertilizers, uh, other types of amendments, mulching. Um, so it's just a little more concentrated and actually it, people can produce a lot in a fairly small area in a raised bed when they're really concentrating their efforts and their resources there. Uh, we mentioned draining uh, drainage earlier. One that people don't think about a lot of times is a lot of raised beds will actually warm up quicker in the spring. So we're gonna talk about what to plant and when, um, when you're ready to plant things. And a lot of that has to do with soil temperature. So regardless of the outside temperature, seedlings require a certain soil temperature to germinate, to get started. And so raised beds, partially because they have that dark, really dark almost uh, black rich soil color, but also because they're above the ground and they're getting the sun coming in and hitting it and warming up that box, kind of like if you set anything out in the sun, you know, in, the, in our warm spring days versus the clay in the ground is gonna take a pretty long time to reach those warmer temperatures even after our days start warming up. So you can sort of get a, sometimes a faster um, crop started in the spring with your raised beds. Um, and then depending on the height, not all raised beds are raised, excuse me, quite as much as we see here, but you certainly have the option to raise your beds significantly. And this can be really helpful um, whether or not you're older, to be totally honest, like I'm already, I feel it sometimes working out there when you're doing weeding um, or harvesting or even meticulous, more meticulous planting and seeding um, to have a raised, raised bed can be a lot easier on your back. Um, and also, of course, for kind of wheelchair accessibility and things like that, um, there are some benefits. And it's not on here, but at in my opinion, one of the biggest pros for raised beds is just the ability to block out weeds. Um, in our area, we have so many, it's not that you won't get weeds that can blow in and things like that, but you tend to start with sterile soil, which won't have a weed seed bank in it already, which all of our soil outside is gonna have seeds and weeds just waiting to come up as you turn the soil over and get it ready. But also we have so many things like Bermuda, if you're dealing with a yard where you're or just a, a spot where you're gonna be planting in an area that used to have Bermuda or is bordering Bermuda, you can fight it back and you'll get a little bit better every year. And especially if you stay on top of it and keep pulling out the pieces and using mulches and things, but Bermuda and, and things that spread like Bermuda are very hard to keep out of in-ground gardens and they can be a huge pain. Um, and that is not as much of an issue when you're dealing with a raised bed. So that can be really beneficial. In terms of um, building a raised bed, we won't spend too, too much time on the details in this particular talk. There's a couple points that are worth mentioning. Um, a lot of the materials that you'll hear about in terms of your wood options, are gonna be probably treated pine or untreated pine or cedar are gonna be the most common wood materials that you would find around here to, to build with. 
Cedar is excellent. It's natural and rot resistant. Um, pine can be fine. Uh, what I, I guess what I'll mention, I think I have a thing in here about the question of treated or untreated wood. Treated wood has, there have been studies even through UGA about the ability of leaching to happen from treated wood into the soil and it's very minor. They're not, stuff is not really leaching into the soil from the treated wood. Also, um, the stuff that they used to use for treated wood that was a lot harsher and had things like arsenic in it was phased out years ago. And so we're not treating it with the same type of harsh things as we think of um, that used to be used in the past. Having said that, um, our uh, David Burley, who works with the University of Georgia at the U Garden and was a professor of mine, he's asked, asked this question all the time. He, he does um, raised bed workshops and makes raised beds with different community groups and things like that. And they actually did just like a casual trial out there because they got this question so often. And he had treated raised beds and untreated both pine raised beds, but both using, and I think I have some pictures later, but the thick, like, you know, two by sixes or whatever um, in their construction and the untreated lasted, you know, almost as long that the, if you're using a sturdy lump, a thick lumber, they'll last a while. I would say it's more important to just go ahead and get the thicker, sturdier materials than to worry about treated or cedar or whatever. Um, there's a lot of kits and things that are sold and I'm not saying, you know, I mean, there's a lot out there and I haven't tried them all, but a lot of times they tend to be rel somewhat expensive and the wood that they have in them is, is thin, even if it's cedar or something that's a nicer kind of quality of wood, a really thin piece of wood is always going to um, wear out relatively quickly. So that's my two cents on that. Go, go big. Kind of like the, the caliper that you see here would be good. Um, uh, just some thoughts about sizing. I won't talk too much. You just want to think about when you're placing your raised beds, being able to get through the middle of them easily. You're going to have some sort of equipment, even if not, you're not using huge machinery. Um, you may have small equipment or a wheelbarrow to help you carry soil and other things through there. So just make sure that you have an easy walking path that will give you enough room. And then in that same vein, um, it's been showed that about four feet wide is a, a sweet spot for raised beds. And the reason for that is you're able to reach in easily from both sides. If you get much bigger than that, then it becomes hard to reach in to the middle from either side and reach things like weeds or even harvesting or planting or anything else. So about four feet wide is, uh, or no, no wider than four feet tends to be the recommendation for that. This is just something, again, I know I said I wouldn't go into details about building raised beds and believe me, there's plenty more details to talk about, but this is, uh, I love this idea and it's something worth mentioning. There's lots of ways to put together a raised bed and, and a lot of them are quite simple, just with a handful of screws and some decent lumber. Um, but these are, can be an excellent choice. I like them because they are not permanent. So you can kind of use them um, in one way one year. And then if you decide that really didn't work, you wanna switch it up, then you can kind of reorient your raised beds and put them together in a different way. Um, they don't require any uh, power tools. So, you know, maybe if you're doing something with kids or something and you don't wanna, you'd be using screws and drills and power tools, it could be an interesting option. But I forget what these are called. I've seen them at hardware stores. I've gone looking for them to make sure they have them, but it's it's like a decking block or something like that. Uh, you could probably find a picture and take it to your hardware store and just show it to the, the person helping and they'd be able to help you find them. But this is kind of a fun way um, to do some interesting uh, raised bed arrangements. So you've got your raised bed built, however you decided to do that really, really common question is what to fill it with. And there's not a magic answer for this. Um, a lot of things you can use. One that I honestly, I love the option of using some of the native soil that's already there. If it's not just 
terrible. Um, and and I, everybody has different opinions of what terrible means, but if it's workable at all and you can use some of our native clay or whatever that's in there, you can amend it really heavily, um, probably before putting it on there, you know, get a shovel in there or tiller or something um, and just heavily amend it with things like mushroom compost, topsoils, um, things like aged manure, compost from the county landfill is really popular in our area and is really affordable way to get a bunch of organic matter at one time. Um, if you're not able to do that and you're really just building up from scratch, you can use a lot of these other things. Steer away from, I know when you go to the any of the nurseries or garden stores or box stores, there's just aisles and aisles of bags of soil and conditioners. So some of these are matured compost, some of these are potting soil, some of these are garden soil, some of these are topsoil, and it's kind of confusing what all of that means. I will say the things that are called specifically like garden soil, and if you kind of look at all of them, if you're able to see some of what they're made up of, the garden soil is made specifically to be blended in in ground with other dirt. And if you're gonna blend it with some of your native soil, you could probably still use that in a raised bed, but you don't wanna use straight garden soil to fill um, a raised bed. The reason for that is it just, it doesn't have a lot of nutrients, um, doesn't have a lot of water holding capacity. It's got, it's very loosely composed. It's got big chunks and is just not gonna hold, not going to hold nutrients very well. The water is just going to go straight through it. And so your plants are not going to get root, good root contact and they will probably dry out. So you don't want to go to straight garden soil. And it usually says somewhere in the bag, like made for in-ground use or something. Potting soil is made to essentially stick in a container and, and get going and provide what your plant needs for that season. And it has water holding capacity and usually has a finer constituent like peat moss and things like that mixed in. The problem is filling raised beds with potting soil is quite expensive. Um, so sometimes you can get mixes at um, commercial kind of landscape supply stores. They'll have whole mixes that'll be good for container gardening or raised bed gardening. And, and they all do diff slightly different materials mixed in, but you can get them in bigger bulk rather than buying them in the bags at a box store. Um, our master gardeners at the Athens Clark County office actually just grow straight into the um, Athens Clark County compost. So if you know it's a matured, decent quality compost, you can even do that. You don't want to risk putting little plant starts straight into compost that may not be fully matured yet. Again, uh, compost talk is an entirely different talk, which we'll have um, in May, we have an hour and a half full talk on compost if you have more specific questions about that. So we talked about raised beds a little bit and um, I'll pause and look through our chat box in a second before I jump to the, the next section, but there are also reasons to grow in ground. I mean, in ground has its own advantages. Um, it requires actually less water generally to grow in ground than in raised beds because your earth in the ground and especially our clayey earth can hold water a lot longer than a little relatively small, very loose textured container. And so um, you do have to stay on top of watering and have a more meticulous water regime if you're going to be doing raised bed soils because they can dry out um, a lot faster. Um, growing in bed in ground requires just less upstart material. So you're not having to to buy a raised bed lumber or bricks or you know whatever you decide to build it out of um, and do all of that. And you're not having to, you may wanna purchase some amendments to go in with your, your soil if you've garden and ground either way, but you're not having to go out and purchase something to fill your raised bed with. Um, so that it, it tends to be a more economical way to go, um, but everything depends. Um, you can also, it's more conducive to using tools and light machinery in, in an in-ground bed that's harder to do in a raised bed. If you want to go through and do a bigger area and prep everything at once and till and that kind of thing. And then another thing is if you have um, a larger kind of in-ground area, sometimes it can be easier to practice crop rotation, which we're not going to get super into in this talk, but it's uh, an important way to 
improve the sustainability and health of your garden is to kind of rotate the types of plants that you've had in one space to another space. If you just have one or two raised beds that you're concentrating in, it's really hard to, to do that. So certainly there's not one perfect or better answer. It just depends on what you're, what you're looking for. Um, before we go into this section, let me just jump over here to the chat box. We have a couple people in the waiting room as well. If I can figure out how to use this. Mm -hmm. There was some good conversation I saw going on. I just want to make sure that I didn't miss any questions. We've had a, Barbara's had some luck with container herbs. Herbs can be great. Herbs are one of those things that would rather just be left alone and not watered and kind of forgotten about in a lot of senses if you have them in the right spot. Um, some good comments. I just want to make sure. So we had a question from Julie. Um, she's got beds about two feet high and she fills the bottom. So she fills the bottom of the beds with rotting trees. So rotted wood um, from around the house. And her question was, are there any trees that I should avoid for this? So for one thing, that's a good point, um, especially if you have really deep beds. So we constructed these really deep, nice beds uh, outside of our office that we wanted to be taller so that they were more ADA accessible, but to kind of cheat a little and, and fill up some of that space so that you're not having to fill all of that cubic footage um, with compost or, you know, well amended soil and things like that. You can put stuff like mulch or rotted mulch and wood and things in the bottom of your bed just to sort of, and it'll continue to break down and eventually it'll kind of turn into just a broken down organic matter. Um, Julie, not off the top of my head, if stuff is pretty well rotted and is breaking down well, I don't know of uh, like one that I can think of for sure is black walnut if you happen to have a bunch of random black walnut but there are other allelopathic trees that exist I don't know how much they retain that that an allelopathy after they're dead and rotted that's probably something I would stay away from so what you could do is kind of search allelopathic trees or even southeast and what all that means is it's a fancy word to say that it's a plant mechanism to kill off other plant competition. So things can't grow under other certain trees because they send out chemicals that sort of keep things from germinating and growing so that they don't have as much competition out in the woods. So there are some trees that do have those compounds in them, which you know you would think you wouldn't want around your root zone of your plants, but there's not that many that do that. Um, and I, I, you know, unless, if you happen to have black walnut, maybe steer away from there and you can check out what some of the other ones are, but most of the rest of them should be fine. The only other thing I can think of is maybe if it's a lot of pine, it could have a fairly low pH, but again, as that rotting process, the further into the rotting that it goes, the less that should be an issue as well. You just may want to um, consider how far up in your bed you have that uh, rotted material. Um, Jackie asks, what would make compost not herbicide free? Great question. So this goes for any kind of gardening. Um, do be really careful about where your compost source is coming from. And actually even hay, if you're getting into mulching and things like that. Every year we get questions um, and plant samples sent in from folks where they've gotten compost from or rotted manure or something like that from somebody that's just been making their own or maybe uh, there are neighbors or neighbors of friends um, that have a horse pasture or something along those lines and they've got a lot of great manure just piled up and so they compost it or they give it to somebody else to compost and then it makes its way to your garden. The problem with that is there are really common pasture herbicides um, that are perfectly legal and safe to use in their context and everything else, um, but they, have high residual and so they will kill broadleaf weeds so that's just non grassy plants and they do it very well and they do not break down entirely the chemical compounds don't break down for a while and so they can be eaten by the horse or the cow or whatever and pooped out 
and still be active for up to several years, depending on how they've been composted and how long it's been. So a lot of times people will get compost from an unknown source and it's come from a manure or something like that is the most common thing that's happened. And those animals were grazing on a pasture that had um, that type of herbicide in it. And so um, tomatoes, lettuces, pl plenty of things can be affected, but those are the ones we see the most often. They'll come up and they won't grow quite, quite right and they'll have weird kind of curly leaves and there's really nothing you can do about it. So if you've amended your whole uh, garden and that and then planted into it, those plants are probably no-goes. And then you could mix it in really well to the soil and it might be okay the next year and you can, there's ways of kind of testing it a little to see um, before you plant a whole nother garden, but your garden this year is, you're gonna have a really hard time with it. So that's something to just make double sure. Um, that you know that you're not getting herbicides in your compost. That, that's a great question. Thanks for that. All right. So before you plant your garden, I'm just keeping an eye on time here. I think we're doing okay. Um, before you plant your garden, soil testing. So any garden, uh, whether it's fruit trees or a vegetable garden or you're gonna put ornamentals in or you're about to start a lawn, it's always good to do a soil test. It depends on what county you're in. It varies a dollar or two, but it's about $8 per soil test. Um, and basically what it does is it tells you, I'll have a small picture later of what a, your results will look like um, when you get them back, but it tells you your pH. Um, I'm, I have a whole slide and I'll tell you in a second and we'll talk about it. So. Consider soil testing before you plant. Consider if you might need a structural support of some kind for some of your plants, maybe before you go in and, and plant your whole garden up. And then consider some types of preventative weed control that you could do before you plant. So for the soil test, this is what I was talking about. This is tiny, you're not, you don't really have to read it. Um, I just wanted to give you a demonstration of what it sort of looks like when you get your results back. But basically it's gonna test for things like phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and zinc. And it'll show you if you are, have a deficit of any of those. It'll also give you um, a verbal readout of depending on your soils and where you're at, how much in the crop you put in the type of crop. So there's one code that's just home vegetable garden and it'll break it down and usually give you a few different pieces of advice depending on groups of plants and how much they need of different things, but it'll give you a recommendation of how much to even put on your garden per hundred linear feet or per thousand square feet or something like that. But to me, um, even more important than the, the fertilizers, and I take that with a grain of salt, but is the pH, and for a couple of reasons. One, you can fertilize all you want, but if your pH is way off, your plants are not gonna be able to access the nutrients that are in your soil, so it's a waste of money and it's frustrating. The other reason I think soil testing pre planting any kind of garden and is, is so important is that pH and because it takes a while for pH to change. So generally here we have, it's uncommon that we have too high of a pH. Having said that, highly amended organic kind of raised bed soils, I've certainly seen high pHs in. Um, and so the way you would fix that is adding a sulfur product, usually if it's way too high, um, but that's you know, call your extension agent or email them if you end up with um, results that are high and they can talk through you, um, through with you, uh, how much you would want to add of what to try to bring your pH down. But more commonly um, in our area is we have a pretty low pH. And vegetables grow, most vegetables grow best around 5.5 or 6 to 6.5. Um, 6 to 6.5 is probably safe for most things. And we tend to have below six somewhere. I mean, I've seen as low as like 4.5 and just really uh, scraped off soils that's just getting really down into the clay. Um, but a lot of times it's 5.5 or 5.7 or something like that. And you wanna bump up that pH a little bit and you'll do that with lime. Sorry about my dogs. They probably deer in the backyard. Um, and lime takes a while to work. It can take months and then to fully uh, react, it can take up to a year or two. 
but even just giving it a few months head start can do a lot to get your soil closer to where your pH closer to where you want it in your actual time of planting. And so it's just really good to know where your pH is. So that's my, my thing about soil testing. Structural support. Uh, this is just a couple of examples. There's all sorts of really cool ways that people um, support their vegetables and things on trellises. Some plants are going to really need a trellis, things like uh, snap peas or pole beans. Um, trying to think, I'm sure there's others. Uh, they're going to need something to climb up. Cucumbers are going to need a support system. And then there's other things like you can see here where melons and gourds and other things like that, you can really gain a lot of space if you have a relatively small area that you're working in. There are some things like um, vining gourds and squash and melons that would take up a massive area on the ground that you may not have. But if you want to consider providing a trellis system and, and moving them onto a structural support, that can maybe give you some more space in your garden to grow. Uh, a lot of tomatoes, you guys know, especially the indeterminate kind that just keep growing and growing, can really benefit from some support. And that could be as simple as some T-posts with strings in it that you attach the tomatoes to as they grow. But in most cases, it's good to know, one, just thinking through having these materials when you need them, but it's generally easier to plant the plants along where you have this stuff already installed. Um, once stuff starts vining and getting kind of crazy, it's really easy to try to install it and snap things and mess up the roots and yank them and kind of manhandle them. So if you know you're planting something that might need some structural support, it's I recommend putting in the support ahead of time and planting alongside of it. Um, we control we control is a constant uh, before, during, after planting is always something to consider. But the reason I just wanted to throw it in there is there are a few things you can do ahead of time that can make it a little bit, the battle a little bit um, easier to win, I guess, or stay on top of. And two things that I just threw in here, this is pretty, just two things that came to mind. So fairly basic is one, if you prepare your site, whether it's in ground or in your bed even, especially if it's a soil that's been in there a few years and had a chance to get things blown into it and um, a seed bank in there. If you kind of turn it over and prepare your soil at least a few weeks ahead of planting, if you're able to do that, um, what you'll see is you've turned over and made really nice uh, flat weed bed and brought these new little weed seeds up from the ground that were maybe a little bit deeper down and they're going to start germinating and look somewhat like the picture on the left. And you can go in there just with like a really light, you know, lightweight hoe or just a hoe and just scrape the top and get all of that up. And you've killed hundreds and hundreds of little bitty tiny nothing weeds that within a few weeks would have been <laughs> massive and a mat covering your garden. So as opposed to just planting straight into that, even though they look really tiny and innocuous now, um, all of those weeds are very good at competing with whatever that you, you've put in the garden. And so it's worth um, kind of giving some of those seeds a chance to germinate and just barely and get really tiny and just kind of scrape them off the surface and kill them that way. Um, and then you've, more will come in um, inevitably, but you've sort of at least reduced the numbers that you're gonna be fighting in a few weeks. Another thing that people um, ask about a lot and that you know, I've done before and can certainly work, but it's very specific timing based and situation based is solarizing. So solarizing is basically putting clear plastic over a moist, well um, prepared bed area. It can be a raised bed or in ground. And you can find out more information specifically about it, but basically it cooks the top just a few inches of the soil, but that can go a long way to kill back some disease issues maybe if you'd had some, but also can kill a lot of the weed seed bank in those top few inches and it can give you a head start. Again, eventually weeds are gonna come in, um, but it can do a good job of slowing them down. The problem with solarization is you need really at least six weeks to have that plastic on there and it needs to be full sun, sunny summer weather. And so the, that tends to break up 
a lot of our growing season. Where I can see it being helpful is if you want to do a, an area of your garden that's more cool season, where you're going to plant a bunch of cool season things late in the summer, early fall to kind of uh, harvest throughout the fall and early winter, then it could be cool to pick out a six week section of just the hottest part of the summer, you know, in late June or July, solarize it for six to eight weeks and then do your late summer planting of your cool season stuff and then you've kicked back some of those weeds so those are cool a couple of things that could help you out so the fun part um, is choosing what to plant this is another sort of one of our section breaks so let me just go back to the chat box for a second here since I'm my own moderator um, let's see uh, Jackie had a follow-up question to that herbicide compost. So in general, if we don't treat the yard for weeds, um, it should be okay. Uh, Jackie, I guess, are you speaking of having herbicides in your garden space? I'm, I'm guessing that you're talking about in terms of having your garden space herbicide free. So um, if you're worried about selecting a site in your garden or, or your compost, um, your compost should be fine as long as you're not using, so the, the herbicides that tend to, and uh, I guess if you're using your yard compost and you might've had some of those herbicides on there, you might just have to check and see what herbicides have been applied to your yard. So if you've been doing like grass clippings from your yard and you have a lawn person or you yourself applies certain herbicides, you may wanna check uh, the labels of whatever herbicide that's being applied and it'll talk about there are usually warnings and very specific instructions on the label about how long it takes those products to break down. And they'll sometimes even talk about compost. Um, but yeah, that, yeah, grass clippings. If you're not applying it yourself, just ask your, your lawn service, hey, you know, I'm using this in my compost. Do you mind letting me know what active ingredient or what product you're using um, so I can check it out? And if you have any questions, once you figure that out and you're having trouble finding it on the label, um, that's something that your extension agent would be happy to help you, you know, figure out um, before you use that on your yard. Uh, let's see. We had a question from Kevin about folding in old oak leaves that you have in the winter. So that should be fine. I wouldn't put anything unrotted or unbroken down. I wouldn't plant directly into fresh anything. So that could be wood chips, that could be leaf litter, that could be, you know, logs or whatever. If you're going to plant into something, it should be well broken down. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, it's, this is sort of dovetailing a little bit, but a really common question we have all the time is about using wood chips in the garden and people hear different things that you really shouldn't or they're great or whatever. Um, wood chips are fine if they're fresh wood chips. I'd use them for like walkway mulch for a while because the fresh wood chips, you don't wanna stick directly in your garden. If it's more, if it's a larger plant, you could get away with doing it just on the top as mulch. But when those wood chips get incorporated into the soil, they actually rob the soil of nitrogen and that's getting into soil science and microbiology. But basically to break down the wood chips, all the microbes have to have nitrogen and to break down the carbon and so they will rob nitrogen from your soil and so they'll actually deplete it of nitrogen which is really bad for your plants also stuff that's not well broken down um, can heat up actually you know if you have too much of it there because of the composting process you're essentially composting while trying to grow something in it which is not ideal um, so if you have things like uh you know, your piles of leaves and things from the fall or winter, I would pile them all up and sort of do a rudimentary, even if it's a very kind of laissez-faire compost pile and let them break down a little bit and then, and then use them either as a mulch type product over top, or you can mix them into your soil, um, or you can do what I think it was Julie was doing and, and you can use them as more of a filler and then you can put some other dirt, uh, amended dirt on top. So, but you can certainly use those. Uh, the molds that grow on our, our oak leaves and things like that are not typically the same thing that's gonna attack our, our vegetable gardens. Na, na, na. We had a question about lining raised beds 
with cardboard. Uh, I'm assuming that's in terms of using them, using cardboard as whether it's raised beds or in the garden as kind of like a mulch barrier. You can do this. Uh, what you wanna be careful of is that it's not like a really shiny, either waxy or plastic covered cardboard because the water won't infiltrate. It'll just go off the side and then you're getting very little of your soil surface area open to water infiltration. But you can use this almost like a landscape fabric, like a free landscape fabric. If you wanna line areas of your garden and have a space in between and you can plant the plants in between the cardboard, that just creates like a mat kind of mulch on top of the soil where it makes it harder for weeds to come up and compete. So that, yeah, that can be useful. And there's so many uh, versions and ideas out there of how people do these in different ways. Some people build up whole garden beds and let them break down. And then once it's broken down, they kind of uh, cut into it with the shovel and plant into it. Some of them just use it like newspaper or cardboard as a, a landscape fabric barrier kind of substitute. Um, but yeah, yeah, you can certainly use cardboard as a mulch. Uh, you don't do it way too thick. It's a similar thing with the, the water infiltration. You can do it pretty thick if you're gonna let it break down for a while, but you don't want to do lots and lots of cardboard so much that rain's just going to hit it and never make it all the way down and, and roll off. I have never tried a solar powered robotic weeder. I have seen all sorts of interesting things coming out in the agricultural realm in terms of like laser weeding and all sorts of things. I'm still just out there and it's part of my meditation. I just, I just weed with my hands or I, or I don't and I have a very weedy garden. Um, Trang said we have pine trees, so we have a lot of pine straw. How is that a good way to use it? So pine straw makes a great mulch also. Pine straw is a great landscape mulch in the southeast here. I mean, you'll see it all over um, campuses and um, landscapes and everything. It's a very good mulch. You can use pine straw as a mulch in the garden. I would say anything that's kind of large and fluffy like that, even big um, wood chips and anything that's going to be not super fine. I would have the plants get up to, you know, I don't know, it's subjective, but like a decent height kind of get established. And then you can go in there and mulch alongside of them. You never want to have any of your mulch right up against the plants. It holds moisture and it creates a refuge for pests and things. So even if you're mulching, whether it's cardboard or pine straw or hay or whatever you have around, always keep that mulch a few inches away from the plant on either side so you get good air circulation. Um, but yeah, you can go in your raised beds or your garden and, and put pine straw as your mulch. Anything that's like a, a um, organically and by organic, I don't mean non-chemical, uh, I just mean made of an organic substance that you can incorporate on the top to sort of form a weed barrier and to break down water droplets and to reduce heat and water, um, improve water retention and reduce evaporation and all that kind of thing. Um, mulch is going to be great and pine straw is certainly fine. Some people will warn against too much pine straw over and over because of leaching and decreasing the pH. I think if you're starting with an okay pH, it takes a lot of leaching for the acid from those pine trees to really, I don't think it'll affect your pH too drastically, maybe over years and years, you'll just have to resoil test and see. Um, all right, so let's hop into it. Yeah, we got about a half an hour. I think, I think we'll be good. Um, let's get into our plants. So we've talked about all this prep and all these things. What about our plants that we're gonna plant? And so there's several things you can think about before going into the planting season and actually starting things. So first thing we'll touch on is seasonality, uh, space that you have in your garden the difficulty of plants, because yes, some of them are harder and easier to grow. And then more just practically, what are you gonna use? What are you gonna eat? Um, which is worth thinking about. Don't worry about reading this. This isn't even the whole chart, um, but this is uh, a UGA publication that people use all the time. I find myself referring to it fairly often. And it's the UGA vegetable, planting guide or something if you want to google it this is one of the things that i can include on the resources at the end of the talk at the the post class email that i'll send out um but this is a great just sort of quick reference one thing that i will mention 
uh, you can kind of go through and read the columns just to save us a little bit of time on, you know, later too when you're looking through it. But one thing I'll mention is there are ranges. Um, there are sometimes multiple seasons that you can get away with planting things. So you can either plant them um, kind of going in, especially cool season stuff, going into the spring when it's still kind of cool or coming out of into the fall, kind of out of the summer when it's getting a little cooler. So it'll tell you all that. But the grain of salt you have to take this with is that it's going to have a range here um, of sometimes a fairly large range. These are very rule of thumb. And the reason I say that is this is a UGA vegetable planting guide for Georgia. Uh, and if you've seen a hardiness map of Georgia, if you've lived in Georgia very long or visited different parts of Georgia, South Georgia and North Georgia and Piedmont, Georgia have very different weather. Um, and so this is not differentiating all of that. So I would say don't go with the earliest date on here because this is going to range from South Georgia to North Georgia where we are. We're not quite in North, North Georgia, but I would err towards the side of um, the later range on these charts. These charts are also just a way for you to kind of glance on there and be like, okay, I'm, it's about time for me to start thinking about planting this, that, or the other. Um, what your planting date is gonna be based on is whether it can tolerate frost, um, if it's a warm season or cool season. And sometimes, not only there are these, but sometimes a seed packet or something will even give you the soil temperature that something needs to be before it's going to germinate. It's a very simple rule of thumb. If you don't have that, most warm season vegetables require at, at least 65, around 65, if not a little bit warmer, soil temperature, not air temperature. It takes the soil a while to warm up um, after our climate or weather starts to change. You may be asking, well, how on earth do I know that? One, you can buy like a 10 or $15 little soil temperature thermometer that you can stick in your garden if you want. Um, another thing is, is there's this nifty website and my thing is in front of it. So I, I think it's georgiaweather.net. Um, and this is a series of weather systems that is owned by the University of Georgia all over the state. Um, and you can go on and click your closest weather system and click on like a 30 day summary or historic weather or the, the, the stuff for the day. And it'll tell you about precipitation. And it'll tell you about highs and lows, but it also has three little very convenient columns of, I think it's two, four and eight inches of the soil temperature. So you can look at the last 30 days soil temperatures um, in your area and kind of know if you're in the range. But that's sort of, I mean, once you, a lot of people don't take it that far. You're just sort of, it's spring, it's time to plant. Um, a lot of uh, seed packets will have a sort of rudimentary chart on the back of them where it gives your, you know, we're clearly in the orange here. So you can plant about like this. Uh, again, February to March, anywhere from almost the tippy top of Georgia down to Florida. So I would take that with a grain of salt. Just know if something is um, not frost hardy, uh, just make sure that you're planting it and putting it out when we don't have a risk of frost anymore. If you're going to do a warm season spring thing, if you haven't been in, and I'm speaking for Athens area here, and you'll have to look up your own hardiness zone if you're kind of outside of this area. But if you haven't been here for very long, we're zone 8A. And our average last frost date is like April 16th or something. It's around, around Easter. Um, so that's when it's supposed to be safe to start putting things out in the garden is like mid-April. Sometimes we get a really random late frost or even snow in April. So just be aware, you still have to kind of keep your eye on the weather. If something like that does happen, you could go out there and throw a frost cloth over your plants that you just put out there or something like that. Um, but mid-April is our, our safe date in this area. So seasonality, like I said, you have a lot of resources you can look up in terms of when is a good time of year for different regions um, to plant certain things when you can get away with it and when cool season things are gonna do the best in our area and, and that kind of thing that could, you can spend a while on that, but there are resources out there for it. Difficulty is something 
worth talking about just because I, there's myself again, myself included. I've tried plenty of things as an early gardener and I threw things in the ground and either wasn't really prepared very well when I put them in the ground or I started with something that was really pretty difficult um, and I was not prepared for the difficulties and it failed and it was really, I was disillusioned and I kept gardening obviously, but it you know, hurt my feelings a little bit to lose all my plants and that's also kind of a waste of time and money. So if you're really new to gardening and you're excited about getting started with it, I would highly recommend starting with some of the, the easier intro plants and there's tons of them. It's not, you know, you won't be too limited. And then if you want to kind of get more adventurous and try your skill and grow some other things, you can grow a lot more things as well. But I just threw together, this is a relatively subjective, but it is based on on some things um, list of the things in the left column here are pretty easy to grow. Um, and it can be different for different reasons. So a lot of these things, not all of them, but a lot of these things tend to have relatively low pest pressure. It's like basil, um, kaolin collards, cherry tomatoes, okra, hot peppers, uh, spinach, arugula, green pepper. Sure, there are things that can get on them and eat them and you, you may have to deal with some stuff, but they are not gonna have the type of disease and pest pressure that some other garden plants tend to get. Um, also things that grow really vigorously or have a short lifespan tend to be easier to grow because there's less time for them to develop diseases and pest issues for the longer a plant is out there in the, the garden, the more chance it has to, to have a disease problem develop or for pests to find it and for them to grow to populations that can decimate them. Um, but a lot of times it's just a matter of they're just hardy um, quick growing, good producing plants. So that, I'll leave it at that. These are tend to be pretty safe, good things to try to jump in with. Um, on the right, you can certainly grow all of these things here. People do, you'll see them at farmer's markets, um, but there are different reasons that they're a little bit more difficult. I would say the cauliflower, Brussels sprouts and broccoli, and even heading cabbages could fall into that. They just, they take a while. Um, they take a lot of space you're planting something that takes a really long time to give you that last product. And so there's a lot of chances for the plant to fail or for a pest to get in there or for something to happen. And then you've put all this time and effort and garden space into it. And sometimes you won't ever get a head of broccoli out of it for whatever reason. There are rots and things that can get into the crowns of those plants. There are worms that will get into the middle and once they've eaten out that kind of growing center, it's over. Um, cauliflower can get uh, fungal diseases if you're not careful, or even sometimes if you are careful. So I have grown these. Other people have grown these. It's possible. It just might be a tricky thing to start with. Corn is actually surprisingly easy if you give it enough nutrients, but it's huge. And so if you just have a small space that you're starting with, you really can't get away with just planting one or two corn plants. That's uh, something that some people try is they just have a little bit of space, but they'd love to have a little bit of corn in there. And so they plant a couple of plants. The problem is corn, unlike most of our other kind of vegetables, because it's a grass, it's wind pollinated and not pollinator pollinated. And so it needs a pretty solid stand of corn, like a block of several rows of corn for that pollination to be good and for the kernels to fill out. So if you just plant a couple of corn plants, you might have beautiful plants, but not corn or, or no corn or just ears with little spotty um, kernels and things that don't really work out very well. But if you do have the space, it is, I mean, corn can be pretty fun and magical just to have in your garden. Pumpkins and some of the winter squashes, again, I think partly because they are such a long growing season that a lot of pests can come in there and kind of kill them before you get anything but also because there are certain types of squashes that do great in our area and certain types of squashes, even some really common ones that do great a little further north, even further north in our state, <clears throat> but really don't do well with some of the molds and mildews and things like that that we get down here where it's a little more humid. Um, so they are tricky or they can be tricky. And then green onion is pretty easy to grow. Bulb onion, again, totally doable. 
that can have more issues longer. It takes longer. The starts are really small and can be really fragile. And if you don't get them going well, they can die when they're young. They can get rot issues um, in the actual bulb themselves if you haven't quite worked out your water and your drainage. So that's my, my thoughts on, on easier and harder things. Other considerations uh, is just how much will you eat of something? So certain things like zucchinis and some summer squash, like I've overplanted patty pan squash plenty of times. They're really fun to harvest and they do really well, but then you end up with like a counter full of patty pan squash and I just can only eat so much of it. If you have a plan for giving it away to friends and neighbors or some sort of freezer recipe where you can chop it up and whatever, go for it. Um, you found a, a thing that works and you wanna just plant a bunch of that, that's fine. Just uh, keep that in consideration. Things like cherry tomatoes, um, again, you can get away with just, if your tomato plants are doing well and, and yielding pretty well, you can get away with just a couple cherry tomatoes, whereas some, sometimes people plant you know, all their, or half their garden in cherry tomatoes and then you just end up with millions. But I don't know, I could eat a lot of cherry tomatoes and people are usually very happy to take them off your hands, but it's just a, a consideration when thinking about how many of different things to plant. Um, if you have a limited space in your garden or capacity to plant, some other things that you might want to think about is just, I'm only going to be able to plant this many things, so what do I want to plant? Maybe I'll plant something that's not that easy to find in the grocery store down the street, or maybe I can get it at the farmer's market, but it's kind of pricey, so I'd rather, you know, that's one thing that I can get this um, you know, there's stuff at the farmer's market that's great and you might just want to get it there because it's fresh or at the grocery store or whatever, but it's super cheap and easy to get, whereas this other stuff um, is kind of expensive to buy, so I'll grow it myself. I definitely sort of balance things out that way. If I know I can just go buy it um, somewhere else for like nothing, then I probably like field peas or, you know, like it would be really fun and I like the idea of growing um like my own black beans and just keeping them. But when it comes down to it, I only have so many things I can grow and to I could buy a bag of black beans like this for like $2. So I, so I concentrate on other things. Um, some things just, and everybody has their opinion, some things are just better out of the garden and you different people swear by different vegetables, but, and you can just tell a difference. And cucumbers taste amazing straight out of the garden asparagus I think tastes amazing straight out everything really does but there's some things where I, I would almost rather not eat it store-bought um, if you can get it straight out of the garden so if you have those things that you really have a strong opinion about um, those are worth concentrating on um, we have a little bit of time left and I think there's just some like addendum slides after this but what I do want to make sure we get through before we're done is transplants or direct seeding. And I think we have enough time to do that. Um, why would you do one or the other? The pros of transplants are gonna be that it gives you a head start on your season. So <clears throat> like we talked about in our area, you really can't put really warm season things out in the garden until at least mid-April. And honestly, I'm usually a little bit like overly cautious because I just don't like the heartache and headache of putting something out and having to worry about the weather changing. So I usually push it even a little further past the frost date before I like to put my really warm season stuff out. But it takes six or eight or so weeks sometimes to get a seedling up to a decent size. And so you're talking about starting way behind if you're if you don't get them start either buying them from someone or starting them yourself as seedlings um so that's one reason uh it is also helping you put a competitively sized plant out in the garden i mean if you're very diligent and you don't have a chicken that's going to scratch it up and you don't have water that's going to you know you have pretty even soil and you're not afraid of water washing it away and you're not going to let weeds get in there and overtake it you can plant some of these things directly into the ground but you're talking about putting a little seed like this in the ground for things like tomatoes and peppers um, versus sticking a plant like this in there and then having to worry about just keeping the weeds at bay and it's going to have the competitive advantage to really get ahead of those things 
So it's got a much stronger um, advantage if you're able to put a start or a seedling in the ground instead of a um, direct seed. And then similarly, it allows you to really baby and fertilize and water well and create a strong plant. Whereas if you're putting a direct seed for something that small uh, with a seed that small, it would probably not quite be quite as robust as the one that you started inside and babied for six weeks or eight weeks. Um, the And this is supposed to have directly in the ground over here, not transplant. So the pros of doing a direct seed is that it requires no extra space or heating, or you don't have to buy them, which is a lot cheaper to just do direct seed than having to buy seedlings or having to find space to raise up these seedlings somewhere. I know for me, there's not many places in my house that have it, and I don't haven't bought grow lights to mess with that yet or anything. So it's tough. I have limited real estate for starting my seedlings. Um, so, some seedlings don't tolerate transplanting. So one reason to direct seed is that you don't really want to transplant a carrot um, or I think I have a list somewhere because I can't think of things off the top of my head. A lot of root vegetables, you're, they don't have the type of root that tolerates being taken out of the soil and having the soil messed up and putting back in there. And the, a lot of times they'll wilt or they'll just never really take hold the way that they would. Um, and then there's other plants that tend to be Okay, I, I did do a, a list here. There's other plants that just tend to have a really easy time and they grow so quickly and they have, they tend to be the larger seeded plants. So the larger the seed, to me, that's a very rough rule of thumb where that's something that could just be directly seeded outside. They have a lot of storage and nutrients and they come out of the seed in a much faster kind of robust plant than these little tiny seeded things. So. Beans are a great example of that, corn also. Um, okra does not have a huge seed, but it's a pretty tough plant. So as long as you can keep it weeded while it's really small, it usually doesn't have too much trouble competing. And then the lettuce has teeny tiny seed, but a lot of times people will scatter just whole little blocks of um, scattered lettuce seed. Uh, and that's a really easy way to just direct seed something versus doing individual transplants. Um, we mentioned a lot of these, but some of the things that you would almost certainly want to start as a seedling or buy them as a seedling would be tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, um, probably just for the jump on the warm season. Brassicas like collards, broccoli, kale, a lot of those things I recommend starting as a seed, as a starting inside or buying them as a seedling. And part of it's just because they're so small and frail when they first get started that I've put them out in the garden before and tried direct seedling seeding. And sometimes a pest will just come along and like take a bite off of them, but that's the entire seedling. It just takes one bite and that's like the whole seedling is gone. So the really small seeded things tend to do better if you can give them a jump start before you stick them out. Uh, melons and those that you'll see things in the garden centers, like you can buy a little watermelon starts or, um, different squashes, they can go either way. I've, I've done both. They're pretty big seeds, so they start very quickly and they tend to take off fine in the garden, um, but they also have no problem being transplanted. And then herbs fall into that teeny tiny seed category. So most herb seeds are tiny and the new little herbs, you would have a hard time even differentiating them between weeds coming up. So they're probably safer to start little plants and set out. If you are gonna transplant, um, some tips for doing transplants. This is just a nice, oh, I didn't put the citation in here. This is from a Cornell publication. This is just a nice little uh, quick look at about how long they're gonna take to get big enough to transplant outside, which I think is useful, just like a fun table. Just so you know about how early you'd wanna start them compared to when you're planning on putting them outside. Uh, use a loose, fertile, disease-free soil mix. Um, I don't think fertile is as important because you can throw some um, fertilizer in there in different forms once they start to come up, <clears throat> but you do want it to be fairly loose, but you also want it to be fine. Don't use things like the garden soil that we talked about that has huge chunks in it because you're talking about these teeny tiny little roots that have to make it in there and have contact with the soil, and if they're in just these huge voids um, compared to the side of the seed, size of the seed, they're not going to do well. Um, and disease free, it's better to just bring, if you're going to do a few transplants or any transplants, 
to just bring for actual mix that's certified and from like a producer, they're all sanitized and don't have weeds in them and don't have diseases in them that can cause root rot rather than just trying to dig some old soil up out of an old garden bed or something like that. Um, don't keep them soaking wet because everything can succumb to root rot for sure. You never want to keep stuff soaking wet and needs oxygen in there. Let it dry out a little bit, then rewater it. But also keep in mind that they're in loose, well-draining soil and that they have teeny tiny little roots. And so if they dry out one day, they'll die. So you do have to kind of baby, maybe miss them or have a little bit of water that you can put in a tray that allows them to suck it up. There's lots of options for that, but you, you do have to be careful about them drying out without flooding them. Um, and then your options for starting transplants could be in a well-lit room somewhere, in a cold frame outside, or a, even a, a hoop house kind of greenhouse situation, or even just like in a basement or something under a good grow light on a shelf would be fine. We are not gonna have time to go into irrigation, which is okay. I was sort of hopeful when I put in these slides and put it in there, that's really sort of its own talk. Um, we'll probably do, we'll do, we do workshops about irrigation. We'll, we may even do a whole separate green thumb lecture just on drip and different types of irrigation. Um, but that's something at least to consider before you get your garden started. How do you wanna water your, your garden? And my two cents before I, open it up for a couple minutes here at the end for extra questions is just that um, drip irrigation is the way to go. You don't have to do it, but it's not that expensive and it's gonna save you a lot of water. It's gonna reduce disease issues and it's really gonna help you get good deep infiltration in your, in your soil. Whereas it's much harder to do all those things with overhead irrigation and, and the disease factor is bumped up quite a bit when you're spraying your foliage with water all the time. Um, it's not impossible to do your garden with overhead sprinkler irrigation, but if at all possible, I do encourage you to look into the possibility of uh, putting some drip tubes or tape, which we're, we are open to helping with that. And like I, we're, we, we try to do workshops and talks about that frequently. So hopefully there will be some opportunities for that. Um, I'm gonna end it there and just skip through uh, to our final page here this is all about irrigation. Um, I will say in your pre-class email, I sent out a link for um, an evaluation, this little barcode, uh, QR code. You can just scan that right now and do it on your phone if you want to before you forget. In your post-class email, I will also put that evaluation link in there. It's really important to us. We use those evaluations every year to plan out our new season. It's We've been trying to improve upon our talks every year based on y'all's feedback. So please take a few minutes um, when you can to do that evaluation. Also, if you were registered, we already have your email on our registration list and we'll send you a bunch of resources kind of connected to the talk that we just gave. Some of those links and websites, maybe the planting guide and just some of the other things that are relevant. We can send those out in a post-class email to everybody. And if you are joining us, but we're not registered, great. We're really glad that you were able to join us. You can just shoot me an email if you want that post-class information um, here at this email at the bottom. And then our next Green Thumb Lecture is gonna be in March and it's gonna be on gardening with kids given by one of our master gardeners. So that's it. And I know we are right at 7.31, but I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes. If anybody wants to stick around and ask some more questions, uh, I'll open up the chat. And then also at this point, uh, you feel free to unmute and just ask. Um, so thank you all for joining and sticking with me. I know it was a lot to squish into one presentation, but I hope that I covered some stuff that um, will help you guys in your future gardening. So thanks so much for joining and happy gardening.